get the live stream set up now. So let's go live on Facebook. And um, we have a kind of like a citizen science month infomercial um, that I'll do just to kick things off. So people know um, what's going on with citizen science month. Um, and then uh, that takes about five minutes and then I'll kick it over to you. That was great. Yay. All right, and we're going live on Facebook. And for our attendees who are here, thank you so much. We are so happy that you're watching. For those who are watching on Facebook, don't worry, we're paying attention to you too. Um, we want to hear from you. Um, and we will be monitoring the Facebook live stream comments um, you know, throughout the event, um, as well as after. So don't be shy about just getting in touch, um, putting something in the comments that you want to learn more about, anything like that. We're also going to have a survey at the very end. So stay tuned for that. So you can um, give us feedback about anything that you want to learn, um, anything that uh, we can do to you know, make future Citizen Science Months even better. Um, I have some quick slides to go through about Citizen Science Month as an initiative. And then I'm going to hand it over to Rachel, who I'm so excited to learn from. Um, Rachel Hill is a very, I have heard her speak for the first time at the Citizen Science Association Conference in 2019, and I was just blown away. So I'm really glad that we get to work together this Citizen Science Month, uh, get it, um, spread the word about her amazing resources. So let me just get things going. So I'm Caroline. I'm just going to do a quick intro. I'm uh, from SciStarter. Um, but first and foremost, I am a Citizen Science Enthusiast. Um, so I know that, you know, especially through the Facebook page, some of you may not have heard of citizen science before, so I always think it's good to start with the definition. So citizen science, some people call it community science, some people call it neighborhood science, some people call it public participation in scientific research, um, whatever you call it, as long as you're doing real science, we want to work with you at SciStarter. So what does that mean? That means that you're engaging anybody of everybody, people of all ages, of all backgrounds, anywhere in the world, and collecting or analyzing data to understand the world better, to create knowledge. And what is data? Data is just information. Data can be words and pictures. Data can be numbers. You know, maybe you take the temperature to help um, climate scientists monitor weather patterns. Maybe you are taking a picture of a plant or animal to help scientists study their species distribution and to understand if they're doing well or maybe they're endangered and need some help. Ultimately, what citizen science is, is it's a collaboration between scientists and those of us who are curious, concerned, and motivated to make a difference. Or another way we say it at SciStarter is citizen science allows anybody and everybody to turn their curiosity about the world into real scientific impact. And during Citizen Science Month, which runs all through April, um, we empower people to find new opportunities to do citizen science, to join events like this one. Um, and we, you know, citizen science, we can do it year round. April's just our excuse to celebrate. In this particular event, it's really targeted toward educators, but anybody can use the SciStarter website. There, um, scientists and researchers and people who lead these projects have added over 2,000 projects, events, and tools for you to discover. Educators add events too. Maybe you're at your local library and you want to invite people in to participate in the Stall Kinters project to monitor Alzheimer's um, research, to help classify blood vessels for those researchers. You can add that event to SciStarter, get other people involved in the project, and have at it. There are resources on SciStarter for educators. If you go to our education page, which I'll put in the chat later, um, and I'll be adding Rachel's resources to it after the webinar. Um, you can find, you know, lesson plans that researchers have made. Uh, I know Rachel's going to talk more about that, about some specific resources you can get started with, because quite frankly, this can be a little overwhelming. There's almost too much, right? Uh, 2,000 projects, events, and tools. And then on our education page, you know, there are oodles of lesson plans and things like that. So Rachel's going to give you, you know, one specific thing that you could go ahead and get started with your learners. Um, but that being said, you can do citizen science on your own, you can do it with a family member, you can do it at any age. We're just really addressing educators today because that's a huge audience. I know you all love to weave citizen science into your K-12 education efforts, your informal and non-formal education efforts, um, adult learning, university education. Um, educators love citizen science, so that's why this webinar exists. It's for you. But yeah, this Citizen Science Month, it runs all through April. Arizona State University, the Network of the National Library of Medicine, the All of Us Research Program, and so many other partners from all around the world are instrumental in making this happen. Um, so I just wanted to give them a shout out. Uh, we are so, so grateful to them for all that, all that they do with the projects, um, events, materials, tools um, that they empower for Citizen Science Month. 
I'm going to stop sharing for a second because all of us, since they are such a big partner, uh, I have a quick video about them that I'm going to play. And my screen share is loading. There we go. Meet Ray. Ray lives on a farm. He loves playing kickball with his grandkids, but lately he's gotten a little slower and been visiting the doctor a lot more often. This is Kim. Kim lives in the city. She loves to exercise, cook healthy meals, and can't remember the last time she called in sick. They're both people, but not all people are the same. And yet, when we visit the doctor, our treatments don't look that different. Why is that? Because we just don't have enough information to do it better until now. Enter all of us. The research program based on precision medicine. Precision medicine is a revolutionary new approach to treating and preventing disease that's personalized instead of one size fits all. By gathering health data from one million people like Ray and Kim and Trevor and Samir, our country's best researchers will be able to develop treatments that are as unique and complex as we are. With this new information, doctors will have a better understanding of disease so they can innovate the next great breakthroughs in medicine. Once enough people join, suddenly everything changes. Information becomes clear, patterns emerge, and simple data transforms into into life-saving knowledge. This means that Ray and Kim's children and their children's children can live longer, healthier lives. By becoming one of the first one million people to volunteer, you can help reshape the entire future of healthcare for generations to come. If we can figure out how to fly, put a man on the moon, and connect the entire world, surely we should be able to improve the future of healthcare. Not just for Ray and Kim or even you, but for all of us. Sign up at joinallofus.org. The future of health begins with you. Meet. I just saw on Facebook that we have some homeschool educators watching with us too. So I wanted to give Rachel that data point. Um, very exciting that people who might be homeschool educators, I, I think there was an adult educator also watching on Facebook, um, also are here eager to learn, which is cool. We got a diverse audience. And if you're watching the recording, once again, like don't be shy about getting in touch. We really wanna hear from you. But yeah, so you just saw a video. Um, Rachel's gonna be talking about a different project, but I wanted to play that because the All of Us Research Program helped provide some promotional support for Citizen Science Month, including this event. They helped make the month possible. So we like to play that at the beginning of every event. Um, so yeah, citizenfinancemonth.org is where you can go to find even more events. Um, there, there's the calendar. We have lots of webinars, in-person hybrid events coming up that people from all around the world have added. There are some featured projects you can get started with. Um, but for today's event, I'm going to stop sharing here and hand it over to Rachel. She has some exciting opportunities to share, um, especially relating to Marine Debris Tracker. So Rachel, over to you. Awesome. Thanks so much. And thank you to everybody for joining us. So that being said, let's get rocking and rolling. And I'm going to share my screen with you. All right. If you can't, hopefully everyone can see my screen. Let's see here. Oh, no. Yep, I hit the wrong button. Okay, sorry. Didn't mean to share a slideshow. There we go. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. So I'm so glad that you all were able to join tonight as we kind of think about this program. It's called the Junior Scientist Maker Program. And what we're going to do is explore the scientific method through storytelling, inquiry, and citizen science. And as you can see, um, we have an, a young lady there that was working on the project. This was for Girl Scouts. So this can be used in um, non-traditional education things um, that people typically think about. So um, informal, um, such as museums, Girl Scouts, all of those things. Um, but it can also be used in formal settings. We actually just ran a pilot in North Carolina with 15 different teachers, kindergarten through fifth grade. As you can see, and as Carolyn said, we are going to be looking at the Marine Debris Tracker app with this program. So if you haven't downloaded it already, go ahead and download it on your phone now. And then while it's downloading, we'll talk about the program. Because uh, just a heads up, 
part of this program is we're going to go use marine debris tracker because what else to do with citizen science than go be a citizen scientist. All right, so a little bit about me, just so you know who I am. I am, my name is Rachel Palmatier. I'm honored to be here. I um, currently reside in Raleigh, North Carolina, but I'm originally from New York. I am a curriculum developed for a small nonprofit. I've been an outstanding educator, a National Geographic educator. They've got some great citizen science projects and formulas, um, different three classes that I've worked on. And I was a former marine biologist turned into an eighth grade teacher before I took on this role. And I have been doing citizen science and transforming my classroom and spaces for a very long time now. And I love it. So what are we going to do tonight? We are going to look at what is the Junior Scientist Maker Program? What does using storytelling look like? What does using inquiry look like when we're trying to teach young kids? And then transitioning it into being a citizen scientist. So like I said, this program is designed kind of kindergarten through fifth grade, but you can use Marine Debris Tracker and the ideas behind this for whatever age group that you work with. All right, so what is the Junior Scientist Maker Program? It is a great way. It's a five-step program. I'm going to show you a quick little video and you'll see my face again that looks at three steps, really. You're going to watch with your storytelling. You're going to inquire with hands-on learning. And at the very end, you're going to engage with real-world action. So let's take a minute and watch this quick video. Hey, Rachel, make sure you share with sound. We can't hear you. So you might want to stop sharing, then reshare and check that box. All right, sorry, that. sorry one more time. Um, we couldn't hear the sound. So um, you might want to stop sharing your screen, then reshare with that little checkbox check so we can hear your sound. Okay, I am so sorry. No worries. So we're going to share sound. Okay, how about? Perfect. All right. Thank you. Hi, my name is Rachel Palmentier and I am a hands-on science curriculum specialist. I was a biologist and a formal educator for many years before transitioning into this role. I'm so excited to partner with the Paper Girl Show to bring a brand new science curriculum to kids six and above. In this program, we teach young students how to think like a scientist by embodying the scientific method in a unique five-step program. The five steps include observations, asking questions and problem solving, collecting data, communication, and the fifth step is being a scientist. In this step, students will track pollution in their community through the app Marine Debris Tracker. Each of the steps has about 60 minutes of learning time and includes a teacher guide and student worksheets. At the end of the program, participants will use their general knowledge to become citizen scientists, or in other words, scientists in their own community. All right, so that's kind of our outline of our program. And so that first step is looking at storytelling and one of the main things that it's really important before diving right into citizen scientists, especially in those, um, you know, formal, informal settings, is that, um, you know, we take a look at the scientific background behind it. So one of the things that are, as you can see here, is that children are 70% more likely to retain the knowledge presented in a story. So if we can create that story piece for them, especially at the elementary age, it's going to help, you know, create that direct link between their minds and the world around them. So what I'd like to do, and um, hopefully, Carolyn, you can help me a little bit with um, people if they want to comment and stuff like that, because I'd love for this to be a little interactive with as many people as we can, is um, 
I would love to play. I'm going to play the beginning of a Paper Girls episode, and I'm just going to play the introduction for you, and I want you to put on your hat as a student, and when you see that, what are some of the things that jump out to you, that really stand out to you about what you see? All right, so here we go. It's relations radiation from another generation Making makers out of me and out of you Out of you Open worlds of inspiration Fabrication celebration If you dream it, you can make it You can make your dreams come true Wake the population, imagination, illumination Manifested destination, make a space Exceed all expectations and explain the declaration, yeah We can make the world a better place If you dream it, you can make it If you make it, you can be it That's the way that I should be that. That's the way that I should be that. So what did you see? What stood out to you? It's relation. <laughs> what stood out to you guys um, in that particular episode? Like that piece as you're a little kid, what, what did you see? What really? What yeah. And for the people watching on Facebook, please chime in. I'll read your comments out to Rachel, but maybe I can kick things off. I mean, I was really taken like in by the art aspect of it. Yeah. Um, like I was really just looking at the the differences in the types of animation that was really intriguing me. But then the mice themselves, I honed in on as well. And, you know, the fact that it was such an active episode, like lots of movement and things like that. Um, I think that really helps too in showing that these are active characters who, you know, take on the world by storm. Yeah, I love that. So that is just the introduction because the reason there's a change in animation is that there is a real world and that you see that green little potion bottle, it spills and it creates this paper world. And so you have these two strong uh, female characters leading the way to have to solve these STEM challenges in real life. And they have their friends in the paper world that help them. All right, what else? Did anyone else notice anything else? Looks like Amanda in the chat said lots of variety of activities that they are doing. Yeah, yeah. So these young girls, they dive into tons of different STEM activities. Um, one thing that people, I'm not sure if you guys noticed, was the light dress. There is a spot where she's in this bright pink light looking dress. And a lot of times um, young um, students notice that and they're like, oh, you can wear dresses and be fancy and still be a scientist. And it's like, yeah, of course. Anyone else notice anything? Um, Lori is watching on Facebook and she was just saying, I can't wait. This is so exciting. So we got, you got some praise coming in on Facebook, some excitement coming through. <laughs> So what's really fun too is that, um, like I said, these two young girls, um, they go through and these episodes are all available online for free. There's an entire first season, there's 10 episodes and our program uses five of them, but there are five additional episodes and they are tackling real world scientific issues and problems in the sense like these girls in this particular one they have to figure out a way to get the animals to stop eating the mice to stop eating their material their um, pencils and food and stuff like that and so they go and they learn about what affects their hearing and sound and they create this whole thing and so throughout the episodes there are these fun things that happen but there's real science behind it. I like to think of this as magic school bus for this generation. And what's really cool about this is that this particular program was not only vetted by, you know, scientists from diff different universities to make sure that the scientific concepts were real. They also piloted it, the whole entire thing before they released it with the Boys and Girls Club out of um, Brooklyn which is really cool because those kids got to have a voice in what the characters look like and their hairstyles and really making it so that students felt connected with who and what they were seeing. And don't worry, 
Um, I always tell people, yes, it's called the Paper Girl Show, but there are lots of male characters too, because the boys always ask, well, what about the boys? And I said, don't worry, they're there too. So it's so important to use that storytelling. So with this program, we use storytelling and then we dive into an inquiry activity. And as you can see here, once again, you have the Girl Scout. What's great is the mom was holding the phone at the time. So that those that was during, um, unfortunately, the little girls had COVID that are on the phone, but they were able to still watch and participate. So even if you're doing this virtually, you're a student and people can participate too. So you can be in person, you can be virtually. This is something that everybody can do. So the second piece is inquiry learning, right? Now, as humans, as it says here, we retain 75% of what we do. And opposed to like 5% of what we hear, 10% of what we read. And so physically doing the science piece, whether it's starting an activity first and then physically doing the citizen science piece, your students are gonna retain that information. They're gonna be able to take that experience and put it with higher vocabulary, scientific words and knowledge and processes. It's amazing. And you know, as you can see, it helps the lessons become more retainable. And this student, he was wonderful. He was in one of our second grade pilot programs. If we were in person right now, I would actually give you, because one of the activities is a clay boat and they have to float this clay boat. And if we were in person right now, I would give you a piece of clay and ask you to make a boat, get it to float. Because it's really important for kids to go and learn and feel all of those processes. Have any of you guys ever made a clay boat? Like any of you guys? I remember doing it in third grade. Do any of you guys remember doing that? Okay. If you've never done that, I highly encourage you to get some modeling clay and get yourself like a little tub and try to make it float because it's very, very challenging and it's very difficult. And some of your students, they may get really upset and they may fail and they may, well, you think they fail, right? And what's really great is the paper girls have also created a mistake song and how, you know what? It's in, in science, we're, we're not making mistakes, we're learning. And the whole no data is data is so relevant. And so we're teaching kids that you have to be resilient and you gotta keep trying and keep going. And I think that that's so important because a lot of times we don't let the kids fail. Like I said, the other really cool piece about this is that every kid gets their own opportunity to build. So like this young man, he built his tower this way. And I love it because if you look at the picture, he drew out what he wanted and he's starting to make it. And it's really, really great. So what they do is we do this for every single step. So we do this for observation. We do this for the asking questions and um, what are you thinking about? And then collecting data and communication. And once they've learned all about this, now they're ready for the citizen science. Now they're ready. They've learned about the scientific process and they're ready to be citizen scientists. So one of the things is, is there's lots of studies that we have seen where that active role play yields greater motivation and persistence. That's key. And incorporating that citizen science, you get critical thinking, you get community awareness, problem solving, self-efficacy as a scientist, even as a six-year-old, which is so important. And it's even more important. I love that last sentence is that students see themselves as a scientist because they are. And one of the things that we have noticed, they've done lots of research, and this is, well, there's a couple things that are a little scary when you think about it, is that young girls lose their joy, their enthusiasm, their excitement about science as early as the age of six. And so that's why we really wanted to create this program to help motivate not just young girls, but young boys too. Because right now, at least in the United States, and some of you could be chiming in from all over, which I think is awesome. But right now, 
kid from kindergarten to third grade in a typical um, classroom around the United States are only getting 18 minutes of science a week, not in a day, a week. All right, so this is a great way, the citizen science piece, to get them truly engaged in their communities and showing them that they can make a difference. So I'm gonna play this Marine Debris Tracker video for you to give you an overview of the program. And in this overview, you're gonna get to meet Dr. Jenna Jembeck at the University of Georgia, who is the lead researcher on this project. I fell in love with the study of solid waste because it so closely involves people. Every day we decide what to buy, what to consume, and then we have to choose if we're going to recycle something, compost something, or put it in the trash. Unfortunately, some of our items still end up in the environment. Every minute, the equivalent of a dump truck worth of plastic enters our oceans. As researchers, we study plastic pollution all around the world, and this is a global problem. But I think there's this tendency to think of it as something that's far away and far removed from us. But there's nowhere on the planet that's not touched by the water cycle. So plastic pollution can start right in our own backyards. But so can the solutions. Scientists need data on what's ending up in the environment so that we can use that data to inform upstream solutions. But they can't collect this data without your help. The first iteration of Marine Debris Tracker was actually on a personal digital assistant. My students went out and collected litter items with exact GPS coordinates and we could look at the distribution and change of litter on a coastline over time. When smartphones came out, it became possible to collect this type of data on a wider scale, and so we thought, there should be an app for that. Debris Tracker is an open data citizen science movement. We're committed to sharing our data because we believe this problem will be solved more quickly when we work together. When you use the app, the geospatial litter data you collect is uploaded to our publicly accessible database. Scientists, policymakers, educators, or anyone around the world can download and analyze your data to inform their solutions. There's power in numbers, which is why we rely on a community of people just like you to collect this data. The app is free and easy to use, so anyone can become a citizen scientist. Wherever you are in the world, every piece of data that you collect is a piece of the puzzle illustrating the plastic pollution problem. So please join our open data citizen science movement by collecting litter in your community today and help us answer these three questions. What is it? How did it get there? And together, what can we do about it? All right, so that was Marine Debris Tracker and the kids get really, really excited about it. I feel in love. Um, as you can see, this is one of the second grade students that I got to work with. Uh, this was right before Christmas and it was PJ Day at school. So I have a lot of pictures of kids rocking their Christmas PJs or oh, PJs collecting trash at this school. And it was amazing. It was the entire second grade that ran the project. And I'm really excited. I'll tell you some more about that um, in a little bit. But first, like I said, one of the best ways to dive into citizen science is to actually become a citizen scientist. So what I want you to do is we are going to take 10 minutes. And if you can go outside, if you feel comfortable going outside, um, I like doing this because sometimes it's the best way to learn, is on your Marine Debris Tracker app, under actions, um, you can select an organization to um, search for, to collect for, I should say. And what's really great is that when you find the paper girl show, you just click continue, and then we can share our data with one another, which is really quite cool. And then I can show you the data from the whole project. So the app itself is really easy to use. And normally with students, I go through and I work and we just, watch the how-to videos. Marine Debris Tracker, debristracker.org has some great picture tutorials as well for those students who need that. 
but it's super simple. What you're going to do is, and if you feel compelled, since you're going outside, you can pick it up. If once again, if we were in person, I'd be outside with a big old plastic bucket and some gloves that I'd give to you where we would just be going around picking up everything. So what we're going to do is we're going to take about 10 minutes and I want you to go outside if you feel comfortable. And I want you to just walk around, walk down the street and back, walk in your front yard. If you're in an apartment, go down to the stoop in the front, see, and see if there is any trash there. And what you do is in the app, you can search for it. So we tend to find cigarette butts a lot of times, even though schools are no smoking zones. Um, we find cigarette butts. So the kids type in cigarette butts or they have their sheet and they hit how many they find and you click add. If you find a food wrapper, you can type in food wrapper, click add. And then when you're done and you're heading back into your house or your apartment, or maybe you're at school, because I'm not sure where you're at, just click upload your session and it will come and do that. So I, like I said, um, let's give you 10 minutes. If that, is that okay to do that? Is that okay? Let's do it. And um, Lori on Facebook just wanted to share that um, her nine-year-old daughter really enjoyed the Paper Girls clip and um, that she's, they're loving it. So we got some people on Facebook who are participating too. Yes, perfect. I love it. Um, so what you're going to do is go ahead and, like I said, head outside now. It's 8.33, so put a little timer on and come back. And at 8.43, we'll get rocking and rolling again. All right, so let's go see what we can collect. Sounds like a plan. Awesome. And I'll put a slide up letting people know we will be back in 10 minutes. Okay, awesome. Because we are all collecting data. Put that on the slide. And if you're watching the recording, this is also your cue to go out there and collect some data too. So we'll share, make this big. See you all at 8.43.
All right, I am back. Yay! All right. So, what did everyone think? What did we find? I found, um, personally, I found some cigarettes walking down the street and a couple pieces of metal. Anyone else find anything interesting? So I also found cigarette butts, which I think is just a feature of being in Florida. We have a lot of those. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, and I also, I did Marine Debris Tracker actually earlier today, and um, I found some bottle caps, which is interesting, but no bottles. So bottle caps is something you can select on the list I found. So that's something for everybody to note. Yeah, it's fun to see what's actually in the list of things. Cause as you're typing in, some things will pop up that you're like, oh, I didn't know there was a specific category for that. So I'm gonna share my screen again. So that way we can take a look at some of our data. Cause that's the other piece that's really important that I feel like is missed with a lot of kids. Um, not just young kids, but I mean, even as a middle school teacher and I've worked with high school students, we collect data a lot, but we don't actually look at it or what do we do with this? Um, and that's what's great about this program is this program specifically wants the kids to look at the data and then make a, make a decision, make, make a conscious effort in their community of what can we do to make a change. So all you have to do is go to debriestracker.org. And what's the reason why I love searching underneath um, a program such like the Junior Scientist Maker Program is that you can go to the um, data or data tab and we're gonna select that organization. Now you can put in your range. So if you just wanted to know what you did today, you could, what we did today, we could put that in, but I'm gonna have us take a look at everything that's been tracked because I think it's kind of fun take a look at. So what's really interesting is that you can see there was, um, as of right now, there was somebody over. Um, so we can zoom in if my, there we go. You can see that we had someone in Houston that has been working on the program that collected some things. You can see I'm in North Carolina and that's where I have run a lot of the program. But what's fun is that you can zoom in and see all these little pieces. And so this is actually me, I live over here. Um, and you can continue to zoom in and see what are people collecting in certain areas. And then um, this little dot is from me too, because we just did a conference in Chapel Hill and we picked up some things. But what's great is it then analyzes it for you. So it gives your kids an idea of what did we collect? What were our top items? And what's the distribution? So you can see here, 67.9% of what's been collected so far has been plastic. And out of all of these things, the top items have been food wrappers. And the reason I share this with you is because a lot of this came from a, uh, like I said, um, different schools and stuff like that. And what happened is, is that the students took that data and they wrote a letter to their principal saying, you know, there we found all of these food wrappers, we found all of this litter and trash and recyclable things as well. And so we think that we should get another trash can and a recycle bin to sit near these picnic tables where because of COVID, a lot of the times that's where they were eating. And then since then, it's just nice to go outside and eat lunch sometimes. And because the kids had the data to back it up and they went to their principal to show them like, this is what we did. This is what, this is our resolution that we want to do. They then got trash cans and recycle bins for their school. How cool is that? So here are the second grade students being citizen scientists contributing to Dr. Jembeck's project, but also influencing their own community, their own school community. How empowering is that? That's crazy, right? And not only that, they didn't stop at their school. They then went home and wanted to pick up trash and document that at home too. So now you're going beyond your classroom and you've impacted these students. They had felt a connection. They felt a connection with the world around them and they're making it a better place, which is really cool. And I'll share my screen with you again because I wanted to show with you some of the results from, if I can, 
So here we go. That we've seen in that, like I said, we ran a pilot program and we wanted to ask the students their opinions. What do you think? And because of the program, we saw 82.8%. Now these are students saying, wow, because of this program, I really like science a lot more. That's, that's great. We want to inspire those kids to be scientists and keep going. And then 82.2% .2 of them enjoyed helping a real scientist. They thought it made a big difference. What's great is that through this program, teachers, 100% of the teachers now feel confident to implement not only this citizen science project, but to do a couple other ones because we don't just do marine debris track and we have lots of other stuff, but this program focuses on marine debris track. And then 100% of like general education teachers, so they are the K through five, they're teaching um, a lot of times in North Carolina, we are not um, separated out by our subjects. Um, they teach math, science, all of that. And so what they said is they, um, reported that their kids were more engaged, they were working collaboratively, and they were having fun. And I did add some quotes in there because I think it's important to hear from them as well. You know, students enjoying the lessons and applying them to others' uh, academics. They look forward to every Friday. So she was running the program on Friday. And that elementary student learned that they should never give up. Remember when I was talking about the boats and all of those things? And you should always keep trying. And then I really like this other teacher said that the biggest benefit, and this one came from a STEM specialist. She, it is a STEM school, so they could do a lot of hands-on STEM, is that they got to do data collection skills. And they collected, recorded, and compared that quantitative data. How cool is that, that our elementary students are really diving into that, which is great, right? So if you are interested in this program at all, what's great is that um, that's my information. You can always email me. Simply go to this website, and I know that SciStarter is going to put it up. And I'd want to take you there to show you that the website is so easy to navigate. And... So with this program, you can scroll down and see that um, all, here are all of the steps. And when you click on the steps, we have a couple different options. So it talks to you about observation and what we're looking at. It has the episode that you're going to watch. We've created an educator's guide and a worksheet. Now you're going to say, Rachel, where well, there's two different ones there. Well, the one that says Sybil's Educator Guide is the one that has that hands-on inquiry piece with it. But if you don't want to do the hands-on or you don't have um, the materials or whatever, that's perfectly fine. You can still do the paper girls, the storytelling piece, and it'll take you outside and play more in the space and then do Marine Debris Tracker. But if you wanted to, if you were like, man, Rachel, I really want to do that hands-on piece, you can simply, um, what Sybil does is as a nonprofit, they'll package all of those materials into a bag for you, and 35 of those bags, they'll send it to you. Um, and, the, and it says to purchase the box, it's just Sybil as a nonprofit, they just charge what we get charged. And what's really cool is after working with some teachers, we have been able to transition our activities to have like paper straws and wooden things to really support that whole idea of sustainability. But I do want to show you, like here's your be a scientist. I want to show you what like our data one, when you go into it, what the educator's guide looks like. So if you wanted to open up that educator's guide. You can take a look and see, hopefully there we go. It's, and it just step by step, where to pause the video, what to talk to the kids about, all of those things. It also gives you a class outline of how long it should take to do those things, which is really fun. And then we have the simple student worksheet that goes along with it so that when kids can take a look, they can write their answers down or you can upload it into Google Classroom or Canvas or anything like that. But we wanted to make this program so user-friendly 
And so one of the things, and I apologize because the thing keeps popping up, is under be a scientist, we also have the data tracking sheet, which Marine Debris Tracker and National Geographic have another version of it. This is just super simple to find. It's under the student worksheet. And you can, so for those kids who don't have devices and maybe you're doing it as, a, as the teacher is implementing it, it's perfectly fine. And they go through their steps first of what do they think, collecting data, communicating, all that stuff. And then they can document it there, right? Because we want them to not only be citizen scientists, but go through that whole scientific process too. So that is our really cool program that I wanted to show you that it really is a turnkey, great for educators. If you're new to citizen science, this is a great way to get your foot in the, the toe in the water. That's what it is. Put your toe in the water, just get going with it. It's so easy and fun to do. If you've been doing citizen science for a long time, this is another great project to add in. And like I said, this particular program just focuses on Marine Debris Tracker, but I've worked with kindergarten all through 12th grade with using like Seek and iNaturalist and Ant Picnic, and there's so many other great projects. So if you have questions about those too, you can always email me. Yes, Ant Picnic, I know you were really involved in developing the curriculum materials for that. That was awesome. I actually, we have a question for you on Facebook. Um, there's a library watching and they wanna know, um, could the, do you have any ideas about how they could adapt the paper girls materials for their library? Okay, so um, one of the best ways you could do it is honestly, um, I know a lot of libraries run, because I have two little girls that are my neighbors, they run like special events on certain nights or things like that. And you could create a really fun series. You could call it like the Paper Girl Scientist Series where like you do one step each day. So maybe they come to the library on Tuesday evenings for an hour and you do the observations and then you do communication and you work through. And then at the very end, you know, you all go out and you track the data and then you share it and they could create posters that are put up at the library. Um, I think it would be great to do. It's a great way to get the whole community involved. That is great. That's awesome. Um, so I also, I'm curious. So you mentioned the data part of the, that, that was one of my favorite parts of the presentation. Do you have any ideas about like ways to, because like I think, so people participate in citizen science and we have this shared data-driven understanding of the world. What comes after? Like, do you have any ideas for if someone does this project with their students and then they have some data-driven analysis of what's going on in their community, what do you think they should do with those with that data? What should be the next steps? So I definitely think it depends on like, honestly, grade level where you're at, but anybody, I would say if you're doing it at a school or community, start with your next higher up, you know, start with a principal, then move up to your superintendent. And if you are a homeschool or you're a library, like go to the next, um, you know, council meeting where your representatives are there. And, you know, maybe you trapped at a local park and you realized all of this trash was there, you know, Having this data and especially having it collected by students, a lot of the times students' voices have a, are a lot more powerful than adults. And so if you can get your students and it's great for them to practice going and speaking to adults and getting that opportunity to do that, I think that that's so important for them to share their experiences. So I would definitely say like go to your principals, go to your superintendents, go to your local um, meetings, community members, and if your representatives are in the area and they're at a town hall meeting, go and share because that's the only way that we're going to make a difference is if, like you said, we're sharing our data. And one thing that was really cool that I forgot to share with you is I did get to speak with Dr. Jembeck and she was saying how because this is an open source, people are using this to make policy changes and doing different things like that, which is really cool to have a kid hear that, that what they're doing is impacting a much bigger scale. Yay, awesome. And then uh, another Facebook viewer, I see someone watching who actually works with the Girl Scouts. Um, 
Yes, I wanted to remind people that uh, Marine Debris Tracker is featured in the SciStarter Think Like a Citizen Scientist journey for Girl Scouts. Um, mm -hmm. So if you end up picking that as your project for your girls um, and you want a complimentary activity, I think the paper girls materials would be perfect. Yeah, we um, we ran that with the Girl Scouts so that they could get their citizen science badge. And they actually, so I never get the levels right and I apologize, but I think it's the brownies and the daisies, which are the littlest and then the step up. And one of them went further to create signs along the trail, once again, based on the data and put out recycle bins and to help get their, it's like this whole journey versus just the one badge, they got the journey and they were so excited about it. <laughs> so that was really fun. Awesome. Are there any other questions from our friends on Zoom? I see Anne said that she didn't find much during the activity, which is great. That means her neighborhood is very clean. So yay, Anne. Um, but any questions from people watching on Zoom and any final questions from people on Facebook? Um, while they all get their final questions in, I'll ask one of my final questions for you, Rachel. So you've done a bunch of citizen science at this point. What do you think makes Marine Debris Tracker different from other projects? I think Marine Debris Tracker is one of the easiest projects to use especially for younger scientists that want to get involved. Um, and I think that that's where a lot of the times we're missing the mark when it comes to science is that we're not targeting enough hands-on real projects that a younger child could do. And I think waiting until middle school or high school is we're losing them too soon. So Marine Debris Tracker is definitely different because you can, I mean, I had one of the girls and Girl Scouts had a young sister who was three and this three-year-old was going with us and picking up pollution and thinking about it. And I think that that's what makes Marine Debris Tracker so amazing is that a three-year-old and a 12th grader or college student can be just as excited. Granted, it's for different reasons, but they can both successfully do this project, which is really cool. Definitely. And I think um, I just really want to commend you and the whole Paper Girls team, because I think the value of having something like the Paper Girls attached to this project is that having beautiful materials and engaging content like that really helps with a holistic experience. You know, that's the excitement and the education in addition to, you know, doing the real science and collecting the data and then looking at the data analysis. So just a huge shout out to you. I'm excited that we're going to be able to feature this on the SciStarter education page. Um, and for those of you watching, whether you're watching live or watching the recording, let us know if you participate. Let us know what your experience is. I logged my data earlier on the NOAA list. I need to switch it over to the paper girls list. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, I thank you again, Rachel. Is, do you have any final thoughts for us before we go? Just it, go out and do some science and do some hands-on. Um, your kids will be changed for the better. Your students will be changed for the better. It can be a little scary sometimes, but get past that fear, do it, and you're going to see a huge change. I know. Yay. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Check out the program. You guys have my email. Let me know what you think. Bye. Bye.